Welcome to the Military Money Manual Podcast, where every episode is all about achieving financial independence in the military faster than before. We believe personal finance shouldn't be boring or intimidating. Building wealth can be simple, and financial freedom is the ultimate financial goal. Now, here's your hosts, Spencer and Jamie. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie, and I'm here with Spencer Reese from the MilitaryMoneyManual.com and author of the book, The Military Money Manual. In this episode, we want to share advice and ideas on how to budget. Uh, I want to give a quick shout out first before we get started to Adrian and his wife, Jennifer, who I recently met. He stopped me while I was waiting for my lunch the other day on base. That was pretty cool. And they're both fans of the show. So we love hearing from you guys. Anytime you you see us and you reach out or you reach out to us online, we we appreciate that. And it means a lot to us to hear from people that have actually benefited from the show. So Adrian, Jennifer, thanks for being uh, listeners and the best part of the show. So when we talk about budgeting, Spencer and I have different approaches to budgeting, and we'll share those with you as well as some other ideas that you may like on this episode. We're going to talk today about three main ideas. When you budget, you have options. It could be full up spending plan with maximum detail and maximum effort and maximum time commitment, or it could be something like the anti-budget, which we'll have Spencer explain in a couple minutes. You have uh, lots of options there in how to budget. Number two, budgeting can actually give you a sense of freedom to spend in alignment with your goals and priority and doesn't have to feel like handcuffs or constraints or cutting costs um, severely. And number three, no matter what method, app, spreadsheet, or method you choose, budgeting is practically guaranteed, in Jamie's opinion, to make you more financially secure. Hey, Jamie. Uh, Thanks for that introduction and great three main points there. The second one where you talked about how budgeting can actually give you a sense of freedom, I was reminded of Jocko Willink, Discipline Equals Freedom. He's a Navy SEAL that hosts the uh, the Jocko podcast, and he's been on the Tim Ferriss Show and a bunch of other places. And he has this book called Discipline Equals Freedom. And basically, his argument is is like when you're when you're disciplined and you you know commit to something and you stick to something, it actually leads to more freedom than rather yeah. than just you know being willy nilly and not actually committing to anything. I love Jocko. So we. Yeah, he's a he's definitely a, a beast of a man. We mentioned uh, in last episode about the December 2021 report from the Congressional Research Service called Military Families and Financial Readiness. And we talked about how in the paycheck to paycheck cycle, uh, 30% of your military peers are not secure in their finances. So while you might be listening to this podcast, and you're like, dude, I've got YNAB, I've got a budget, I'm, you know, I've got an emergency fund, we're all set. Maybe you know, that's, that's great for you, but maybe some of your friends, maybe some of your coworkers, maybe some of your subordinates, maybe some of your superiors, maybe someone that you know in the military is struggling with finances. And so it's important to take this. And even if you're not going to be using it today, maybe someone, you know, will mention something offhand about how like, man, like I, you know, inflation is, is crushing me. Like I, I can't afford my, the payments on my truck anymore. I can't afford to put mm. gas in my Ford F-150 anymore. Sorry to all the Ford F one fifty owners out there. Yeah, we have it's been crazy. kind of ragging on on F one fifties a lot recently. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, Rap, the Raptor edition, man. It's a beautiful truck. Don't get me wrong, but just you know, it's a lot of it's a lot of money. Um, and anyways, we talked about lots of people might uh, that you know might be struggling, and so if you hear that, maybe point them to this podcast or point them to the paycheck to paycheck cycle that we talked about in the last podcast episode. And you know if. Um, one thing that I tried to do when I was a supervisor of airmen was during my initial feedback, midterm feedback and final feedback, uh, every, basically every chance I got to formally sit down with my subordinates, we would talk about finances and we would go in at, into as much depth as, as they were comfortable with. So, you know, I would have them pull up an LES just to prove to me that they knew where to go find their LES we would talk about you know their TSP contributions. We would talk about their emergency fund, and just having that conversation, just normalizing talking about money, can be so impactful for people mm-hmm. who might be right out of high school, and maybe they come from a family that didn't have that kind of relationship with money, where it could be talked about openly, and where they could see money as a tool to achieve their goals rather than as something to be feared. All that to say, if this if this episode isn't for you, that's okay. But if uh, if you know somebody out there who could use this information, you know, point them point them in this direction. One thing that came out of that congressional research uh, study 
was that less of less than half of service members keep a budget. So only 46% of service members surveyed kept a budget. And so I think, you know, for me, eh, that's that's not such a bad thing, but um, maybe they're all practicing the anti-budget. No, I I, I don't <laughs> think even, even the anti-budget, which we'll get to in the details of that later, I mean, even that is an intentional and thoughtful way of managing your money. And yeah. so if somebody asked me, do I keep a budget? I would say no, but... But, and then, you know, and, and everything that comes before a but doesn't matter. And it's everything that's afterwards. And, and <laughs> I guess you could say, I do, because I track my spending, I track my investing, and I make sure that my savings rate exceeds my, you know, how much I spend. So do I keep a budget? Yeah, sure. I guess, I guess you, could, you could say that I do. But um, yeah, 46% of service members actually keep a budget. And the rest of you out there, 50%, more than 50%, are not keeping a budget. If you can be intentional early in your military career, and sometimes for, for most people that starts with having knowing where your money's going and then allocating your income to a specific purpose. I mean, you could, if you started investing when you were 20, um, you can turn every dollar that you invest when you're 20 into mm. dozens of dollars when you're 65. Jamie, you've got here uh, one dollar invested when you're 20 turns into 88 dollars when you're 65. Is that based on the um, compounding returns of the U.S. stock market? Yeah, yes, that is. Um, I actually borrowed that from from another uh, financial podcast and and a couple of guys that I follow called the Money Guy Show. Um, but it, they have a whole um, document. And it, it, what's interesting about that is if it's 25, it cuts down to like 44 dollars per dollar yeah. spent. So the earlier you can start being intentional and putting your money to work, the better it's going to be. And I think that's an uh, excellent example of of how important it can be to start early. And uh, what is it you say, Spencer, about the best time to invest was yesterday and the second best is today? Is that it? Am I quoting right. you? No, that's yeah. exactly right. And it's the same thing with like, you know, what if you want if you want the shade from a tree, the best time to to plant the tree was 20 years ago, but the next best time is today. So um, if you're listening to this and you you haven't taken action, you haven't started, you know, allocating some money to your TSP, you haven't opened up a Roth IRA, pause the episode and go do that. You know, like take take some action because all this is just it's just me and Jamie talking. We're we're trying to do our best to to motivate you and to provide a little bit of perspective, a little bit of military personal finance perspective. But unless you take action, then you're just you're just listening. It's just it's just fantasy, fantasy uh, role playing personal finance. <laughs> I think another good way to think of impact of early decisions is let's say that you have a choice between buying two cars and am I going to take out a loan and pay uh, $560 a month or am I going to do uh, put some down and buy a cheaper car or whatever to where I only have to do $400 a month. So let's say you, you're looking at a $400 a month payment or a $560 a month payment. So $160 a month difference. I would encourage you to consider taking out a loan for neither of those amounts, but let's say you have to for whatever reason. So $160 a month, if you're if you're early in your career, um, that could be a half a million dollar decision if you invest that $160 a month difference over the long run of, of the next several decades until you reach retirement age. So um, think of it of when you're budgeting, it's helping you put every single dollar you have available to work towards your financial goals and towards your future self. And like we said in a pr previous episode, if you need to get specific budget help uh, for your situation, you've got the Family and Fleet Support Center for the Navy and Marines. You've got the Airmen and Family Readiness Center for the Air Force, the Army. Uh, sorry, I forgot to look up what the uh, the Army version of it. I think it's the Soldier and Family Readiness Center. But there's there's financial counselors there. Some of them have uh, CFPs, Certified Financial Planners. That is not an easy designation to get. I mean, it's like two thousand hours, two years. You have to like get a master's degree, and you have access to these people for free. Where if, whereas if you went off base, if you're in the civilian world or you're a veteran, it's going to cost you, you know, a, for a fee only financial planner, probably like three or three, four, five hundred dollars just to sit down for a you know one or two hour session to have them review your finances and provide some specific advice to your situation. So take advantage of those yeah. 
resources while you're while you're in the service. And if you're if you're guard or reserve, um, you you probably have access to similar services as well uh, from the active duty. So make sure that you're you're taking advantage of those financial counselors. And remember, like we talked about in the last episode, if you're in that paycheck to paycheck cycle and you get behind and you get into a situation where you can't pay your bills and you can't meet your basic needs, there are assistant loans available from the Air Force Aid Society, from the Army Aid Society, the Navy and the Marines uh, and the Coast Guard all have their own uh, assistant loans as well. And usually those are 0% interest. uh, They don't go on your credit report and you can pay them back over a very flexible schedule. And that's just a great tool there to buy you some time and allow you some breathing space so you can get back onto the straight and narrow path to financial success. Okay, Jamie, with with all that said, what's the first type of budgeting that we're going to discuss today? Okay, so first, let's look at a detailed budget, which is maybe what you might think of as a traditional uh, budget when the word comes up. Some people don't like the word budget because it makes it sound so negative and like, constraining. So sometimes you'll hear people say spending plan. I may even say that sometimes um, synonymous. So your detailed budget could be in another uh, various forms as well. So it could be on paper where it's as simple as listing out all your monthly income, listing out all your monthly expenses or any irregular expenses that are occasional or every other month kind of things. And if you're not sure, like we said last week, take your best guess. And then after a couple of weeks, it'll settle out and you'll see the trends. You could also start by writing down, keeping a small notebook or an iPhone app or something like an iPhone note and just uh, document everything that you spend or look at your credit card statement, your debit card statement, your checkbook, if you're still using that um, and just kind of take inventory of where things are going. But a written budget is simply just going to on paper say this is how much we're spending we we plan to spend this much on gas, this much on food, this much on groceries versus eating out, this much on, you know, grooming, haircuts, whatever, this much on kids school stuff like back to school st- time right now. Just just hit our budget. And that's always fun. Um, things like that. What you do with that information can vary. You could go like the Dave Ramsey method and get cash out of the bank and stuff it into envelopes. Or you could track it manually on paper, like a checkbook register kind of set up. Um, so there's a lot of options you can do. And we talked last week about prioritizing your four walls. So make sure the most important items are at the top of your budget and then work down the page to more of the discretionary spending. But dig, uh, detailed budget version one is just simply writing it out on paper and getting a good lay of what you expect to spend each month before you start spending any of your money. I think the cash envelope thing is, it sounds really old school, especially coming from a guy who has 30 credit cards and is a (laughs) uh, pretty, pretty advanced travel hacker. I think, I mean, that's how I got started is we, we did the cash envelope. We did the cash envelope thing. And just to get into the details of that. So basically you say, Hey, we're going to spend $300 this month on groceries, you know, $200 on going out to eat. And you go to the ATM and if you got USAA, Navy Federal, you're going to get your ATM fees reimbursed. So Make sure you, with a bank, Schwab uh, is also a bank that Ally, I think, also reimburses ATM fees. But if you're with a bank that doesn't reimburse ATM fees, that's a good sign that you need to leave that bank ASAP yeah. and go to a bank that actually respects you enough to refund your ATM fees. Uh, but yeah, just go to put, go to the ATM, pull the cash out, and put it in the envelopes. And it it just it rewires your brain to recognize what three hundred dollars looks like and how far it goes when you go to the grocery store and you grab a couple things that weren't on your list and you throw them on there. And that, to me at least, when I was when we were first getting started, my, my wife and I were first getting started and I was in that paycheck to paycheck cycle and I needed to break it, doing the cash envelope system was, was critical to rewiring my brain uh, to look, to understand like what I was spending money on and how we were going to make the money go further. And it motivates you because what we did was if we had money left over in any of the envelopes, that was money for us to go spend on whatever we wanted to, or to say, you know, if we got to the end of the month and we had an extra 150 bucks, cool, throw that into the vacation fund. And now we're $150 closer to, you know, taking our next vacation. So the, I think the cash envelope thing is, is underrated. Uh, I think it's a great place to start. 
and then for us, the next step was a debit card. And, you know, we had a debit card the whole time because we were able to, you know, go to the ATM and get cash out. But moving from the cash envelopes to the debit card and keeping track of our transactions in a Google sheet, which is how we did it uh, at the time, that was how we, we really broke the paycheck to paycheck cycle. And the most important part of breaking the paycheck to paycheck cycle is that first paycheck, right? That first two weeks or that first month you need to go from basically being two weeks behind to getting a week ahead or two weeks ahead. And I know YNAB, we'll talk about YNAB, you need a budget, but that's what YNAB is all about is getting ahead of your paycheck so that when the money comes in, it goes where it's it's allocated to and and you're putting it to work in a way that, um, that you want it to. We're going to talk about, let's see, um, Google Sheets, an, an app like Mint or YNAB and a couple other budgeting tools here, Jamie. But I think the cash envelope things, I'm just going to, you know, not to use, to use an over, uh, over cliched military phrase. I'm going to foot stomp it because if you're, <laughs> if you're in, a, you're in a place where you are, you're struggling and you're like, look, at, like I've tried budgeting before. I've tried the apps. I've tried all this other th- stuff. And like, my debit card just seems to like slip out of my wallet and like slide through the register or tap on the uh, tap on the screen. And every time they ask me how much I want to tip, I hit the 30% button and I just can't help myself. Well, go to a cash envelope system and, uh, and, and trust me, you will two weeks, two weeks and you'll rewire your brain. And I th- and then you'll be able to move on to some of the more advanced, advanced strategies. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, Spencer, I wasn't, I hadn't thought about talking about the cash envelopes in such detail, but it, it is a really powerful tool, like you said. So I'm glad that you you uh, went on that little rant there. We started out like that as well, and we had kind of two two ways that I'll, I'll recommend doing it. We had a, a period where we did a, a miniature accordion file thing that was small, it's big enough for dollar bills, small enough to fit in my wife's purse, kind of thing. And we each section was a. Um, a different category of the budget, eating out, groceries, clothing, whatever. And then we had like a little sheet of paper in there to be our checkbook register kind of document of minus, you know, $33. Some of the complaints you hear is like, what if, what if my wife has the cash envelopes and I'm out? Well, you can divide it, keep some of it. Maybe your fund money's in there. You can move money around when you get home that night or just carry your debit card with you. In worst case, if you had an unplanned expense, then you can sort it out later. But don't let some of the potential downsides or something that's a minor inconvenience keep you from doing this because it is a very powerful tool, like you said. Well, I think the inconvenience is part of how it helps you to yes. stay on a budget and to get back out of a paycheck to paycheck cycle. And so I think the inconvenience is a feature. It's not a bug. It's actually a feature of the system. And again, like, what are you trying to do here? You're trying to rewire your brain. You're trying to to change your habits and your relationship with money, it gets back to Dave Ramsey, which I hate. I hate to say because, like, <laughs> a lot of his investment advice is is crap, and a lot of the other stuff uh, he says is for people who are bad with money. But all of us start out. Most of us start out bad with money. I started out bad with money. It's true. Like, it's 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 way more than just the math. And if you're letting something like Oh, like what if I'm, you know, like the excuse that you just gave about, oh, if I'm out and I need to buy something, but my wife has the cash, carry your debit card. It's it, use the debit card and then just and like, and then just move the, take the cash when you get home and put it, you know, somewhere else, you know, for, for next month. And so there, like, there's plenty of ways around it. Don't let, don't let perfect be the enemy of good, you know, get to the 80% yeah. solution and the, the 20% will sort itself out. And if, and again, like, if you're on the cash envelope system for a month, trust me, your spending is going to decrease. You are mm-hmm. going to find that there's there's other things to do out there than to than to go and spend money because you're going to be like, shoot, like this cash is not going very far. Uh, so I think, I think, yeah, don't don't let the don't let the excuses um, don't let the excuses take over and use that month that you're on the cash envelope system. And if, if you're on, if you want to do it for the rest of your life, that's great too. But I know for us, we were only on it for like a month or six weeks and the inconvenience built up to the point where we're like, okay, we're going to start using a debit card, but we know that we can stick to the, the dollar amounts that we set 
And we've trained ourselves so that when we go to the grocery store, we buy the things that fit into our budget and we don't just throw in the extra hot sauce and the, uh, uh, what is it? Angry bird hot sauce. Which, or... <laughs> yeah. $10 a bottle. And, and we don't shop. We didn't, we didn't shop at whole foods then. I'll tell you that much for sure. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great point. The, the other thing we did with the cash envelopes for a while is we used actual envelopes um, like you would mail something with and the cash was in there. And then we would literally write the register of transactions on the outside of the envelope. So you don't yeah, have to spend we- any money. You can spend money if you want, but it's uh, it's pretty easy to get started with that. And like you mentioned, Spencer, I think there's probably two main goals of this, realizing your spending and, and cutting back and then also trying to get ahead. You kind of mentioned all three. So I guess that's three total, not two, but trying to get ahead is w- when you're waiting for your next payday, that's a terrible feeling. But if you can temporarily make that adjustment, like you said, then you'll have the ability to get ahead and have the cash on hand or in your bank to cover the next two weeks worth of expenses or ideally next month's expenses. Or when you get really caught up, then you're hopefully working two or three months in advance, depending on how you use your emergency savings and things like that. Um, So cutting back expenses you talked about, but there's something physical. um, It's like emotionally hard to hand over cash to someone. But when you swipe a debit card, it doesn't have the same trigger in your brain. And that's why you mentioned rewiring your brain. It is try it, go to Best Buy. Next time you want to like the other day, I bought a, a new uh, thermostat for a home, $220, one of the Nest ones. And oh, nice. It like try handing over $220 to the cashier at Best Buy in cash and see if it is painful. I can pretty much guarantee that it will not feel great. So anyway, cash envelopes is great. Great point, Spencer. Um, great, great way to start your budget or to get kind of recaged. If you've heard that term of you're a little bit distracted and we, hey, we need to focus again. Let's recage our focus a little bit and it can kind of snap you back to reality and um, and help you out there. The next way you could do a detailed budget um, is version two, I'll call it, is a Google spreadsheet or Excel document. Basically, you track everything. You can make a template. You can find plenty of templates online, just like you can for a paper budget. But you just put it like checkbook register style, or you can have a tab for each credit card if you have multiple um, in the sheet. However you want to do it, basically, the, the important thing is to track. We're spending this amount, that, or our plan is to spend this amount this month on this category. Work all the way down your priorities. And then on the other side of the page or in a different tab, keep track of how much you've spent in each category so you know how much is left. So that's kind of the Google Sheet version. You can make it very detailed. It doesn't have to be super detailed, but it's definitely going to be a intentional way of keeping you on budget, looking at what you plan to spend this month and being, I don't know, intentional is the only word I have there. What do you think of, of the Google Sheet? You mentioned you guys use that in the past. Yeah. And the way that we did it was, um, we would, the paycheck was going to be $2,000. We would have each line item deducting. So we put 2000 at the top and then we'd have each line item deducting from yep. that, um, from that amount. And if it was, if it was a monthly charge, right. Cause in the military, we usually get paid on the first and the 15th. We would just divide it in two, um, over the two pay periods. And then if, there was, we always had, we always had a margin of safety, which was something, you know, once we had broken the paycheck to paycheck cycle, we just had a miscellaneous column and we, we always try to have leftover at the end. So even if we allocated everything, you know, mobile phone, rent, well, at the time it was probably a mortgage, um, you know, car payment, um, mm-hmm. student, student loans, Roth IRA, we would have everything there. And at the very end, that number had to be positive. And we would try to make it positive by a couple hundred dollars. Uh, because you know, things happen like, you know, there's always, there's always something that's coming up and, uh, especially with, you know, social activities, there's always, you know, Oh, it's it's so-and-so's birthday. Like let's, you know, let's go out and buy a couple drinks and you don't think about it, you know, when you're setting up the budget two weeks ago and now you're a couple days to payday and it'd be nice if you had a couple hundred dollars in there and you're ready to, uh, you're ready to go out and, and have a good time with your friends. Another thing I think is really important that uh, reminded me of your unplanned expenses. You could even have a category in your budget 
called unplanned expenses or things I forgot to budget for or something like that. Uh, but another important one is is fun money. So my wife and I each get a certain amount of money each paycheck. So we get, you know, times two in the month and that's just for whatever. So she uses it almost exclusively on Starbucks, which I think is silly, but it's her fun money. So she gets to do whatever. And when I spend mine on dumb stuff on Amazon that I end up not even liking that much or whatever I whatever whatever I choose, it's my fun money. So no one gets to say anything about it. So it can start yeah. small. Like when we first started, I think it was $10 a paycheck, $20 a month maybe. And then we worked up to $20 a paycheck and, and then you can go up from there. But it doesn't have to be a lot, but you have to have a little bit of um, wiggle room in there or else you're you're going to go crazy if you kind of nats ass every little detail uh, of it down to the penny. Yeah, because the thir- I mean, what, you know, over, over, like, like you, like you've said, like over a 12 month period, everything kind of averages out and, you know, some months you'll spend more on one category. The next month you'll spend less on one category. But one thing that I've noticed is that even when I don't track when I, you know, when I, right now, when we, when we track our budget, we do it on an annual basis. So I wait until January or December and then I look back over the year. And if you go listen to the episode where we talked about Spencer's end of year report, uh, we'll do another one for 2022 coming up. But that's just, I just look at how, what did we spend over the last yeah. year? And then, and then talk to my wife about it and make sure that like it's still aligned with our values. And what's crazy is even though, you know, there's, there's, we moved uh, from Abu Dhabi to Hawaii, our rent went up. Uh, from nothing because we weren't paying rent to three thousand nine hundred dollars a month. Uh, food costs, you know, like we had a car, we didn't have a car. All these different expenses, but it still like averages out. And like you basically, even though we weren't tracking it day to day, month to month, and just tracking on an annual basis, it still averaged out. And we were like, wow, that's crazy that you know we we didn't track it and we still ended up spending just about the same amount of money. It's, it is amazing, but you can't expect to start out like that. You have to set the foundational behaviors with these habits we're yes. talking about in order to get to the yes. point where it just kind of happens. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So you mentioned, Jamie, um, the, so we've got the kind of the detailed on paper budget, kind of the classic, you know, uh, 1950s, let's, you know, and, <laughs> and really what you're doing is you're, you're doing accounting, right? Is yeah. This is your income. These are your expenses. You know, if you go to um, getrichslowly.org, J.D. Roth, he has a book called, I think it's like Money Boss or Be Your Own CFO, Be Your Own Chief Financial Officer. And basically what he's realized is like, if you run your personal life like a business, you'll be way more successful than anybody else out there uh, when it comes to personal finance. And he's got a great website, getrichslowly.org, which I think he's like, bought and sold he, like he sold it to someone and then he bought it back a couple of years later for le- for way less than he sold it for yeah so we we talked about kind of the detailed budget uh you know like on paper listing everything out using the cash envelopes version 2 maybe like moving to a google a google sheet and just or like an excel spreadsheet and again with that i i found it when when we use that method the easiest thing to do was say okay how much am i going to get paid um, you know, on my, on my payday, what are our expenses? And a lot of expenses are just, they're recurring. You know, you know, Netflix is going to cost $21 next month because you're on the HD four screen plan and you know, your mobile phone plan. Oh, I know. Okay. Okay. We'll go, we'll <laughs> drop it down to the one, the one screen plan, but <laughs> geez, dude, you, you know, you know that your, uh, your cell phone bill is going to be a hundred bucks, right? Unless, Unless you call your uh, your mother in law in New Zealand for for a hundred minutes, and then it's going to be a little bit more than that. So you, your expenses are pretty fixed month to month, and you can you can plot that out on a on a Google Sheet. All right, if we want to take it to the twenty first century, Jamie, uh, talk to me about apps. What are, what are we using for apps to budget? So there's a, several options we mentioned last week. There's free options mint.com, which you used a bunch in the past. And I use briefly, um, every dollar is the Ramsey app. There's a free version and a paid version. Um, and there's pay- other paid apps like YNAB, you need a budget, which you mentioned, and we've mentioned several times in the podcast. Um, they should sponsor, they should probably sponsor me by now. I think I've mentioned it so many times. You need uh, YNAB, you need a budget costs just under a hundred dollars a year. 
And basically their philosophy and and the founder of YNAB, Jesse Meekum, uh, he wrote a book and he has basically four principles uh, that are pretty good. He'd be a good guest. We should try to get him on, Spencer. You only budget what you actually have. So you don't forecast budgeting next month's money or anything like that. So it's just what you have in your account right now. And um, it's very intuitive. It can link securely to your Amex card, your Chase cards, your USA bank account. And basically it has everything all in one. So you can get reports on your spending habits, how much you've done over the last year, over the last six months. It tracks net worth in there uh, if you feed it all the data um, from external sources as well. So all my investments are tracked in there um, and all that stuff goes in there. And then tonight I was at Publix and went grocery shopping and I'm sitting there at the register and it was you know 86.33 or whatever. I open up my app, I hit plus to add a new transaction, 86.33. I say it's that I'm at Publix and it's going into the grocery budget. And I used my Amex Platinum card ending in this one, XXXX, because I got a couple of them. And then boom, I'm done. And then it's like, okay, minus 86 out of your grocery budget. Here's how much is left. Um, so my wife and I share the budget details on each of our phones and on the website. Uh, it's an incredible, incredibly powerful system when you feed it accurate data and keep up to date with it. It can be a little intimidating, full disclosure to start. There's a lot of great YouTube help videos and help resources. They even have a way that you can ask a question to their customer service and you can temporarily grant them permission to look at your budget so you, they can see exactly what you're seeing. Like, hey, I thought I paid off this credit card, but it's still showing red. Like, I don't understand what that means. So anyway, all that being said, uh, the and any app like YNAB or similar, you should be able to imp input your transaction when you're right there at the store or at the end of the night when you're compiling your receipts. If, if you still want to keep paper receipts, you should be able to see exactly how much is in your budget. And then you should also be able to budget each month and um, allocate where you're going to spend the money that you have. And what one of the things I love about them is that they try to get you ahead. So they really want you to cover next month's expenses so, you know, here it's it's July. If I can have August fully paid for and start working towards September, then that's when you're in a really good, safe and secure spot with your finances. And that takes away the anxiety. And then the last thing I love that I mentioned last week is the reports. The awareness is so helpful when I total up things like I'm spending more than three hundred dollars a month in discretionary streaming services and stuff like that. I'm like, OK, that is interesting to know. I didn't realize I I still had all the you may not even know that you still have HBO Max or or Netflix coming to your bill if you if you're not looking. So I'm a huge fan of of that. If you're interested in a detailed budget, reach out to us and I'd be happy to to share more of my experience on that. But I will I will stop now so I don't bore the rest of you that don't care. Jamie, I want you to know that while you were talking, I just went and signed up for YNAB and it took me about 30 seconds and I just connected my bank account to it. And I'm going to check it out because I've used it a few times in the past and I've just never fully committed to it. But one thing I'm interested in is the reporting uh, feature because it would be really nice if I didn't have to go and total up all of my <laughs> different um, different credit cards and bank accounts. And I know Mint does it for me, but uh, sometimes Mint doesn't work that, that great. So I'm going to take a look at, uh, at YNAB. Well, you should ask for my referral code, but oh well. They do also offer <laughs> a, I think they offer a one month trial. And um, I have anecdotally seen that if you reach out to them and ask if they have a military discount, they will offer you a four month trial, but I can't guarantee that that still works, but I have heard of it working. Wow, that's great. Yeah, I didn't know about the, uh, the military discount. So I know that Spencer, you use a slightly different model. So we we kind of went over the detailed budget in detail no pun intended. And in your book, you talk about the reverse budget, or I've also heard it called, I'm sorry, you talk about the anti-budget. I've also heard it called the uh, reverse budget before. Can you explain that technique? And if people have never heard that term, what that means? Sure. And I, you know, I did talk about it in my book and it is the method that I use now, but I think it's important. And maybe I should have mentioned this in my book too, that you have to use the budget for the situation that you're in. Right. When I was in, mm. when I was paycheck to paycheck, that, you know, the budget, the flexible budget that I use now, it wouldn't have worked. And I needed to break it out of that paycheck to paycheck cycle. And the way that we did it was with the cash envelope system. system and then we moved to Google Sheets. And we used Google Sheets for oh, probably, I want to say 10, eight years, maybe eight years. 
and before finally moving to kind of the anti-budget, the flexible spending uh, budget that we do now. And I talk about my book. I said, um, instead of taking the time to track every category and every last dollar, I prefer to set an aggressive savings goal and then not worry about the rest. And this kind of gets back to what we were talking about with, you know, if now I've gotten to the point where my lifestyle is pretty set, but that's come after a lot of increases in income through the military and a lot of now, you know, and having a lot of savings set aside and having habits that we talked about earlier that were, were built on the bedrock of using the cash envelope system, using a strict budget, using Google Sheets, using mint.com and knowing that, hey, it's okay if I want to go get a kebab salad every week. Like that's not mm. going to break my my budget now. And, but that's something that, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, when I first joined the military, well, first of all, I don't know if you could find a kebab salad in Del Rio, <laughs> Texas, but second of all, uh, or if it'd be any good, but second of all, I didn't have the, the habits. I didn't have the, the strength and the, you know, it's like building a, a muscle memory or, or building a, you know, it's like going to the gym and, and, you know, like doing, doing the bicep curls. Like you have to, you can't just start with the hundred pound barbell. You have to work up to it. So I, I, I think it's it's important, and I probably shouldn't mention this in the book, that you have to use the the strategy that's right for the situation that you're currently in. And so, but the situation that I find myself in at the moment is that I can do the anti-budget or the reverse budget like you talked about. And the whole point of the the anti-budget is you set a savings goal and then you don't worry about the rest. So you you automate and the the beauty of it, and you can go some of the books that have really dove into you know setting up these automated systems. Uh, I know Paula Pant on affordanything.com. She's got a whole article on the anti budget. Ramit Sethi, S E T H I. He's got uh, his book. I will teach you to be rich, which I think the second edition came out a couple of years ago, and it's on Amazon for like nineteen bucks um, or at your local library, I'm sure. Or you can probably borrow it on uh, Libby and read it on your Kindle. That's another good option uh, for, for books if you're trying to save some money. But it's all about just setting up automated systems so that your savings is done. You're paying yourself first. And then whatever's left over, just spend it however you want. Like, don't don't worry about it. You've done the savings bit. And and that, but a lot of that is is being intentional. Like, what are you saving for, right? So if you if you know Christmas is coming, like like it does every year, you're gonna have to, <laughs> have to automate the savings. And that's one thing that we did. Like we set aside 50 bucks of every paycheck so that when we got to Christmas, we had $600 sitting there that we could spend on whatever we wanted. It could be presents for the family. It could be tickets, airline tickets to go see family. You know, it could be, um, we would go see, you know, the Rockettes when we lived in New Jersey, we went to, to see the Rockettes in, in New York city. Um, we like to go see, what is it? The Nutcracker play every year. Being able to have that money set aside and knowing that like that's our Christmas fund and we can spend that money on whatever we want related to Christmas. That's it's a it's a great feeling. It's very liberating. It's kind of like what you talked about earlier, Jamie, where a budget is there so that you know that you can spend money on certain things and it's okay. And there, it removes the guilt of it just it just helps you build a healthier relationship with your money and recognize yeah. that it's a tr- and what you've done is you've done the work, you've been paid for it, and now you get to now society has said, okay, like we've handed you these these fun tokens, go have some fun, go do something with them. But the but the interesting thing that doesn't happen in theme parks, right, is that you can invest your fun tokens. Actually, that'd be a really interesting concept for a theme park, is if you could like some kind of like cryptocurrency thing that you could invest while you were in the theme park, like at Disney World. <sighs> a little side tangent there. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> But uh, yeah, so long story long, um, if you're saving 50% of your income, kind of like what I advocate in my book, like if you're saving 50% of your income, you are no further than 20 years, probably less than that, probably like closer to 17 years away from financial independence. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're going to find too, is that if you set a 50% savings rate when you're, let's say a E6 or an E5, or if you're a captain, you know, you know, like an O3, a senior captain, if you're setting a 50% savings goal, you're going to find that your income is going to grow 
and you're going to be still living the lifestyle that you were living when you were, you know, saving 50% as a captain. And you're going to realize, oh man, I could probably save 60% as a major, as an 04. Or you're going to realize, you know what? I can, I can cut I can loosen this, the purse strings a little bit. I can spend a little bit more. I can upgrade to a better house. I can, you know, have my wife uh, drive a newer car if I want to, because I've got the savings there and we've got a good savings rate and we're going to be fine. Like we know that we're going to make it to financial independence one day and 5%, 10%, like the stock market goes up, the stock market goes down. You can't control that, but you can control your savings rate. And so if you focus on, setting money aside for your goals and then kind of letting your letting your budget or letting your spending just happen naturally then i found that that to be a a good way to to kind of set up set up your money so i think you know the the main takeaway for the anti budget is you got to have the high savings rate and for most yeah. military service members that's going to be maxing out your tsp maxing out your Roth IRA. I'm not saying that that you can do that at every uh, every level in the military, right? If you're an E3 who just came in a couple of years ago, you're going to be hard pressed to max your TSB and max your Roth IRA. But you could set, I don't know, a 25% contribution to your TSB and then spend the rest of your money if you've got an emergency fund. You know, like life's short. If you're living in Germany, Go travel, go see Europe. It's a heat wave right now. So, you know, pack some water, but have a great time. If you're in Japan and you're 22 years old and, you know, you're stationed and just outside of Tokyo, man, like get out there, like go spend your money, go skiing, go uh, just go exploring, you know, go have sake up on some like mountain dojo and like learn karate or something. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Like have a good time. Life's short. So, if you if you've set that savings goal and you've set that savings rate, and the nice thing for military service members, right, is you got the TSP, so you can log into MyPay. You can put say I'm putting twenty percent of my paycheck into the TSP, and then the rest of your pay, like when it comes into your checking account, that's your money. So allocate it as you see fit, and if that means you know you're gonna go out to eat uh, five times a week because you've got tons of friends and they like to do that, good man, go for it, like. No one's stopping you. So, um, and you can rest, you can sleep easy at night knowing that you've got 20% of your paycheck going to the TSP and you're going to be fine. Like, you know, that's, that's probably still like a 40 year, just shy of a 40, 30 year, maybe working career. But Hey, like, like we said, like life's short and your income will probably increase in the future. And then you can increase your savings rate just naturally. Plus the 20% is going to increase your, um, the 20% of a higher income is going to be more money going into your TSP anyways. So I like the anti-budget because for me, at least I, I don't like logging into the apps. I'm going to try, I'm going to give YNAB a try. I just signed up for that. Like I talked about, but I don't like logging into the apps. I don't like allocating my spending. I think part of it too is it's, I grew up very frugally. And so sometimes when I see like, Oh man, I spent two thousand dollars, you know, in the last two months on groceries and going out to eat. Like, man, that that's that feel that two thousand like that sounds like a lot of money. But if you <laughs> like only two hundred fifty dollars a week, so that might be like one nice meal out. You know, it could be a hundred bucks plus one hundred fifty dollars of groceries. Which, depending on where you live, that can be pretty reasonable. So yeah, yeah, I, but. It's still like when you when you when you are confronted with those like large sums, it can be hard. It can be difficult to be like, oh, well, like what what else would I have spent two thousand dollars on? Like, you know, I could have. That's that's a nice vacation, or that's a that's a new mountain bike. So it's a great great segue into uh, rehashing what you already kind of gave us a preview of, of of the fact that budgeting, whether it whichever method you choose, can give you a sense of freedom to spend in accordance with your alignment. So if you're investing 50% of your income, like go enjoy your life, enjoy your going out with friends and all that. If you're doing a more detailed budget, what sometimes people experience is uncertainty can breed anxiety or doubt and not knowing, especially what my wife and I experienced was when she was finishing up nursing school and I was working 
and she was not bringing home any income at the time. She, and we were newlyweds, she experienced guilt of wanting to buy a new t-shirt or something like that. And I was like, yeah, if, babe, of course you can buy a $10, $15 shirt, like whatever it was. We we were in Columbus, Mississippi at the time. So I think the shop was like Walmart. We didn't have a Target. So it wasn't anything crazy. But she felt like because it wasn't her money she was bringing in that she didn't, she wasn't, didn't have permission to spend it. But once we kind of got on the same page with the budget and talked about it and had, you know, had discussions and meetings where we were, we agreed on the budget together. So if we agree that our clothing amount is a hundred dollars this month or whatever, whatever makes sense for your family. And there's money left in the clothing envelope or in the clothing line of your spreadsheet, then go buy clothes with it. And that's completely okay. So it releases the constraint of, of doubt and anxiety and fear and waiting for the credit card bill to come and you don't know how much you spent or how you're going to pay it off when you're intentional about be, uh, working ahead of it. So that's kind of a personal example of, of uh, guilt. Did you, have you guys, did you guys experience anything like that, Spencer, of, of one of you kind of thinking differently about money and having to kind of get on the same page with it? and the the sense of freedom that working together can can provide. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely had like a system worked out in my head when I was living paycheck to paycheck where like I knew how much money I'd put on my credit card, I knew how much money was in my checking account, and I always made sure like I never put more on my credit card than was in my checking account, but somehow it always ended up, you know, if I had $1,001 in my checking account, I put $1,000 on my credit card. And then that was it. Like all the money was gone from my, from my checking account. And like I was telling my wife, like, oh, just wait till next pay. Just wait till next pay. Like we'll, we'll get ahead. But we never did. And that was, that was, that was tough for my wife because, you know, she was like, I can't live like this. I need to know like how much money I have to spend on groceries, how much money I have to spend on clothing. And so that was, you know, a tough time or, uh, a difficult learning experience for both of us to, to kind of get to the point where we had a shared mental model of what our finances were and how we were going to, and then how we were going to get to our goals. And I think, but a lot of it started where I knew I wanted to pay off my student loans, but I didn't really have a, a, a goal past that. And so that was really, it was really convenient that I found out about financial independence and retiring early in 2000, uh, 2012, I think Mr. Money Mustache was kind of the, the 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 impetus behind that. That's also when I started my website to kind of document my own journey there. Without having that goal, it was, you know, I knew I wanted to pay off my student loans, but it's like, okay, but then what? Like, why, like, why save money? Like, what's the point? Um, why not just spend it all today if I'm going to earn a 20-year, you know, pension in the military, which I did not end up earning because I, I left. So I think that's the other thing too is like, you'll change. And that was a, that was a point that Morgan Housel brought up in his psychology of money book was it's hard to plan for the future because, you know, the person that I was in ROTC, uh, was not the person that I was two years after graduating. And it's not the person I am, you know, 12 years after commissioning. So, but one thing, one favor that you can do for that future person is send them some money for, to yourself. And the way that you do that is you invest it, is you buy low cost passive index funds or you buy some investment real estate and you take some of your income today and you put it to work so that future you has some, some income and some assets that they can fall back on. So two other quick things I want to mention about budgeting, some ideas for you to talk about with your spouse if you're married or just things for you to think about as you work on your budget for the first time or, or trying again. One of them is sinking funds, which we've mentioned uh, in the past on a previous episode. This is a concept of knowing you have an expense in the future, dividing it up by the number of months away it is and figuring out how much you need to contribute each month so you're not caught behind. One of the one of the worst feelings with money is being behind. So if you know in a couple months you have a $500 auto insurance bill, then say it's six months away, then you need to contribute $83 a month into that line item of your budget or that cash envelope and label it, you know, 
uh, auto insurance bill and it's due in December or whatever. And then you put $83 a month in there. And then in December automatically, or surprisingly, you have $500 available for that bill instead of what you've done in the past, which is getting the bill. And you're like, oh my goodness, how am I going to afford this bill? I, it's Christmas time. I barely have any buffer. So, you know, you have a $120 ballet performance in three months, then you need $40 a month vacation coming up and you want to spend $1,200 and, and you're 12 months away, $100 a month. So whatever it is, the amount divided by the number of months you have, and that's how much you should contribute each month. And that's sometimes called sinking funds. If you, if you hear that, the second concept, um, I want to talk about for budgets real quick is to watch out for your percentage of your total budget that you're spending in each category. There are suggested templates and amounts out there online of, you know, you shouldn't spend more than 25% on your housing or no more than 10% on this and no more than 3% on whatever. You kind of have to figure out what's right for you. And as long as it works, like who cares? But if you do find yourself spending 40% of your budget on housing, that will probably constrain you in other areas that may or may not be in alignment with your priorities. You know, if, if spending 10% of your budget on eating out, it might be okay for you and it may not. So not, n- not that there's right or wrong amounts, but sometimes just being aware of the percentage of your budget can help you make decisions of, is this really where we want 10% of our expenses to, to go? Uh, of our income to go. I mean, one thing that we did for that was we opened up multiple checking accounts and multiple savings accounts. And then we didn't know the the, con- the concept of a sinking fund or, or I guess the term, the term sinking fund, but that was kind of the, the concept that we came up just naturally was, you yeah. know, we knew we had expenses like auto insurance that was due every six months and renter's insurance and, you know, various other bills that don't come due every month. And so, but like you said, it's just, it's just math, you know, like you said, $500, $83 a month, just set it aside. And then when you get to the month that it's due or the day that's due, then you've got the cash right there and you don't have to worry about it. So um, the other good thing about doing a budget and especially knowing what your expenses are, you know, that's just kind of the first step of budgeting, but is that you can plan for emergency. So if you, if you know mm. you're liable for. Um, and the other good thing about that too is you can decide what is actually necessary and what is just a want. So what are your, you know, what are your wants and what are your needs? That, I mean, that's a concept that a lot of people struggle with sometimes. Yeah. But I, I hate to break it to you, but HBO Max, Audible, Amazon Prime, like all those things, those are all wants. They're not needs. And when you do the expenses and you list it all out, you know, just like put a little circle next to the ones that are, that are wants and maybe a check mark next to the ones that are, that are needs and just recognize like, okay, like we're spending, you know, like my wife and I, um, a couple of years ago, like we were spending three to $4,000 a month on, um, just living expenses. Right. So about $48,000 a year. But when we went through and looked at, okay, what is like, no kidding actually, could we actually live on uh, probably half of that, honestly. Mm-hmm. And that would be staying at home every night, uh, reading a lot of library books and just chilling. But guess what happened? Like COVID hit in 2020. And there were a few months where our expenses dropped to even lower than we had than we had anticipated. Because when you really came down to it, I mean, like we needed to pay our rent and we needed, you know, some electricity and internet. And we needed some food. And then everything past that was just kind of BS. Like it was just, you know, it's good. It's good stuff. And like when you're having, you know, having people over, you're having parties, you're traveling, like, yeah, like that's awesome. Like you want those expenses. But if you need to, if you have some kind of family emergency or if you have some kind of, you know, situation where you need to cut back, going through and looking at your expenses and honestly assessing, is this a want or is this a need? can be can be really powerful and you can recognize like okay I'm spending you know three thousand dollars a month my income is three thousand dollars a month I am living right on the edge but if I look at my actual expenses shoot I could cut five hundred dollars of things today and all of a sudden now you're building now you've got a gap now you've got a gap a five hundred dollars margin of safety there and whatever pleasure you're getting from Netflix, from, we're picking a lot of the streaming services, but they're pretty. They're <laughs> it's pretty, too easy. 
<laughs> it's but, too easy. They're too easy to pick yeah. on. Um, you know, whatever pleasure you're getting from them, I think you'll get a lot more joy from having a margin of safety and being able to relax and being able to just kind of, you know, not check your bank account balance at, you know, in the, in the five days leading up to, to, uh, a military payday. Cause you're like, Oh, did I forget something? Like, did I use my debit card too much? No, you've got, you've got a couple hundred dollars in there. It's going to be fine. And maybe one day you'll build it up. So you've got a couple thousand dollars in there. And, and that's just a, it's just a nice feeling when you're not budgeting down to your last, you know, $10 until that military paycheck comes in. Um, the other thing that, you know, before I started this rant, the point that I was trying to get to is that, (laughs) uh, (laughs) is that when you know your expenses, you can, and you know, your true expenses, you can build a, a good emergency fund and you can know that, all right, we you know, let's say we based our emergency fund on $4,000 a month of spending. And I want to have five months set aside in there. Well, that's $20,000. But if I know that I can, that we can cut our expenses down to $2,000 a month, cut them by 50%, all of a sudden that five month emergency fund becomes a 10 month emergency fund if it came down to it. Right. And I, COVID was kind of like a stress test of that because there were some months where we didn't (laughs) like, we barely left the house, right? Like we got groceries delivered and that was it. And that's sure enough. What happened? Like, just like I said, the, our, our monthly expenses dropped, um, dropped much lower than we had planned for. And so that was a good reassurance that, Hey, our emergency fund is appropriate. And that if, you know, if I did lose my job unexpectedly or my wife lost to her job that we would have the savings there and we would be able to tide ourselves over to, to the next job or, or to the next thing that we wanted to work on. I think that's a really powerful sense of peace and lack of stress, knowing that you guys will be good no matter what. And it, all it takes is knowing the actual expenses and, and writing that out of, like you said, if we need $20,000 in our emergency fund, and we have $20,000 in the bank, no matter what, whether I get med boarded or I have to retire early because they're doing a reduction in force, or if I choose to get out, but the job market's not what I expected, like we'll be good. We have 10 months of coverage in, in that example you gave, and that should be plenty of time to find a job, hopefully for you guys. So that the lack of, of, of stress is a very powerful way to use budgeting and personal finance as a tool to add value to your life instead of it having detract from from your joy and peace. All right. The last couple points I want to mention, Spencer, and then I'll, I'll pass it back to you uh, for closing. In your book, you wrote, identifying where your money is going helps you recognize whether or not your spending is in line with your personal goals. And I think this is one of the most important takeaways from, from today. And if, if you've never thought about budgeting in, in, in that aspect, then please kind of soak on that. Um, Think over that a little bit. I think it's key because it one, it makes you think, what are my financial goals? And two, it helps you be intentional and prioritize what's worth spending your hard earned dollars on. And I think you've mentioned before on the podcast of thinking about spending money in terms of how much of your time you had to work for to actually pay for that. So let's say you make $25 an hour and you wanted to buy a $200 gadget like I did at Best Buy. Um, you would think of that as working eight hours or full day of work to pay for that gadget. So is that worth it? Maybe, maybe not. But at least you frame it in a way that makes you think about what your time is worth. If you're doing something that costs a week of your time to pay for, yeah, that that might make me a little uncomfortable. But if it's only two hours of work or it's one hour of work, then then go go spend and enjoy life. But it's just another way of kind of giving a sanity check of of is this in in line with my priorities and is this something I should be spending money on? Um, So yeah, that's my, my kind of final points there for today. Awesome, Jamie. Thank you for all that. For the listeners. Hey, thanks again for listening to the podcast each week and joining us as we discuss different ways to budget on this week's episode. To review, we discussed three main ideas that you have options. You can go from the full up spending plan, the full up budget, listing it out on paper, doing it in Google Sheets, using YNAB, uh, or you could, you know, if you're a little bit further along in your financial independence journey, maybe you can kind of take the Spencer Reese reverse budget, anti-budget method. And and if you know that your lifestyle is kind of set, 
and that uh, you know even if you do spend a little bit extra, uh, if you've got the the savings there and you've got you've built the habits, you've built the financial strength that you'll you're going to be okay. Budgeting can actually give you a sense of freedom to spend in alignment with your goals and priorities. And it doesn't have to feel like handcuffs or constraints. So that's point number two. And then finally, point number three, no matter what method, app, spreadsheet, whatever you choose, budgeting is almost guaranteed to make you more financially secure. Just knowing where you're at is going to help you so much and where you're going. We really hope today's discussion will help you get started towards financial independence or can help keep you on your way to achieving financial independence while you serve in the military and can also help you maximize your military benefits. As always, if you have any questions or feedback, message us on Instagram at military money manual or email info info at military money manual.com. We appreciate you joining us today. We're grateful for all of you. Keep sharing the show with your friends, family, coworkers. Thanks for being the best part of the military money manual podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of the Military Money Manual podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we really appreciate it. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll catch you in the next episode. Hey, guys and gals, Spencer here again. Before I let you go, I want to let you know about two things. First, my 100% free course, it's called the Ultimate Military Credit Cards Course, and you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. I've been running this course for over four years now, and we just celebrated our 7,000th graduate. In this course, I walk you through an absolute beginner's guide to travel hacking and opening your first fee-waived credit cards in the military. Again, you can sign up today at militarymoneymanual.com slash UMC3. It's 100% free, no spam, and you can unsubscribe at any time. Second, my book, The Military Money Manual, A Practical Guide to Financial Freedom is available on my website and Amazon today. Head over to shop.militarymoneymanual.com or if you want the Amazon version, search Military Money Manual. This is the book I wish someone had handed me on my first day in the military. In this book, I cover the exact money tactics and investment strategies I used on my path to achieve financial independence while I served in the U.S. Air Force. The book is the best personal finance book specifically for you, whether you're an active duty, guard, reserve, a military spouse, enlisted, or officer. Any ROTC or academy cadet can benefit from the tactical and strategic advice I lay out in the book. But don't just take my word for it. Here's two reviews of the book. Ryan on goodreads.com wrote, the most comprehensive investing personal finance book specifically written for military members I've read so far. This book should be handed to every new LT at commissioning. Matt on Amazon said, this book is incredibly straightforward, easy to understand, practical, and useful. This book should be on the Commandant's reading list. Thanks, Matt. If you're interested in the book, head over to my website, shop.militarymoneymanual.com. And podcast listeners can use promo code PODCAST to get a special discount on the ebook, audiobook, and hardcover book. You can find the audiobook on Audible, the ebook on Amazon Kindle, and the hardcover book on Amazon. Or again, head over to my website and use promo code PODCAST for a special discount. Thanks for listening.